in the right way. The one thing that we know works are background checks. Uh, now, most people in this country think that if you're going to buy a gun, you're going to get a background check. And the reason for that is you know, most people buy their guns at federally licensed gun stores. Uh, that's not the case. As much as 40% of all the gun buying and transferring in this country takes place through private transfers. You know, guy where I grew up in Colorado in ranching country selling a rifle over, a, you know, over the fence for the guy at the ranch next door. If you're not buying at a gun store from a federally licensed dealer, you're not going to get a background check. Um, and that has become an enormous loophole that criminals, felons, people who are already barred under federal law from buying guns, criminals, uh, the seriously mentally ill, people who have actually been found so mentally ill that they're a danger to themselves and others and can't have a gun, um, are getting them by simply avoiding licensed dealers and going to gun shows, or increasingly, as our investigations have found, going online, where you can go to places like armslist.com and find tens of thousands of people who will sell you a firearm with no background check and no questions asked and meet you in a parking lot and exchange cash for a gun. We know that if you simply required everyone to get a background check, and states that have done this close this loophole that the federal government refuses to close and refuse to close after our debate in the United States Senate last April, 38% fewer women are murdered with a gun by their domestic partner. 39% fewer cops are murdered in the line of duty uh, with a gun. Uh, 49% fewer suicides, about 50% less gun trafficking. So if you look at states like my home state of Colorado that have actually sort of taken the initiative to take on the NRA and pass these laws require going into background check, we know they work. Uh, and over time, this is why we'll win, because people in Colorado are discovering if you're a law-abiding citizen, continue to buy your guns, the sky doesn't fall. The tens of dozens and soon hundreds of people who are prohibited are being stopped by this new law, and eventually people will understand that. Um, and, and other states will pass this law, or the federal government will, will get it together and pass it as well. So this is something everyone agrees on. Uh, 90 to 92 percent of the American public, depending on the day, think that everybody should get a criminal background check before they buy a gun. That includes, by the way, 81 percent of gun owners and 74 percent of NRA members, because Kevin likes to say about the same percentage of people who, like Ty, think that everybody should get a background check. The one that I prefer is that the same Elvis, am I getting this right? <laughs> What's this like? Mm -hmm. You get to say something. Uh, <laughs> really? The 86 percent think Elvis is tall, but it's the opposite. <laughs> the number, the percentage of people who don't think you should get a background check, are the same percentage of people who think Elvis is still alive. Is that right? <laughs> so, <fine. laughs> so, so. We had, and then I, I want to I turn it over to the others to, to talk a little bit about themselves. Um, when most of us got into this business, kind of arrived at the instigation of a, of a mass shooting at Tucson or in Shan's case, uh, the Newtown mass shooting. You know, this rapidly escalating series of increasingly horrible mass shootings, um, plus the re-election of President Obama, kind of brought us to a point uh, where the country had simply had enough uh, with the massacre of 20 kids my son's age right before Christmas. And the country, I think, reached a tipping point, not just because of the Newtown shooting, but because of the sheer aggregation of all of the horrible things uh, that had been happening. You know, uh, Aurora, uh, Oak Creek, uh, you know, memories of Columbine and Tucson that were just so fresh that the president was willing to take it on and the country was ready to do it. And these organizations have laid a lot of the groundwork in and were ready. So what happened? We had this titanic fight for a year where we worked on sort of the most difficult issue, taking on the biggest lobby. And in the end, uh, we got a majority of the United States Senate to vote for a background check. It was pretty good. It would have required background checks for all commercial sales, not all sales, but the most, including those taking place on the internet and at gun shows, which are the big areas of opportunities for people who don't want to get a background check for a licensed dealer. But a majority of the Senate blocked it. So how do we react? Um, we are continuing to build infrastructure in a way that didn't exist in the past, and this, I think, is our topic for, for a discussion today. Um, when we got into this business, I think we discovered that there was simply no grassroots around it. Uh, and the NRA had some structural advantages that we simply didn't have any way of competing with a couple of years ago, and, and, and there were three big ones. The first one is grassroots strength. The NRA, um, while in many ways overestimated as of a given time, four to five million, well, at any given time, four to five million 
uh, members who are dues-paying members and really care uh, about their rights, uh, and they really like their guns, and that's as it should be. And they, they, they really do things to make sure that those rights are maintained. That's the second advantage that they've had. It really has been this positive, I think. And that's what political scientists call the intensity of preference gap. You know, people like us, at least until fairly recently, you know, we care about gun violence, and we may know somebody or may not who's been a victim of it, but it's one of a lot of things that we care about. People who care about their guns have guns as a central aspect of their lifestyle. My dad was a, a gun dealer, among other things. He ran a country store and sold guns out of the glass case. And uh, growing up, literally, in the house attached to that store, during hunting season, people came in and out of the store all day with guns. Uh, they're in the back of our cars. Uh, we shoot them for fun with our uncles and our dads on weekends. You know, it's, it's a part of life. Um, and the NRA is selling the myth that those rights could be taken away at any time by a government that wants to run your health care and you know take away your rights and will eventually become oppressive like Germany and the first thing they'll do is register your guns so they know where they are so eventually they can take them away. So those folks are very, very intense um, and very, very scared about what the government wants to do with their guns. And our side has not been that intense. And that gap, I think, is closing for some of us to talk about. Third thing the NRA has is a political operation where we really have had none. Uh, they give away a lot of money during the election cycle, and they spend a lot of money uh, to elect and defeat candidates. Now, as it turns out, they give away a lot of endorsements, and they give away a lot of money. It tends to be spread very thinly, so that they're very rarely uh, have an influence that's dispositive in any given election, but you can't find something with nothing, and there really hasn't been anything until Mayor Bloomberg came around and started his super PAC uh, that rewarded our friends and gave them the incentive to do the right thing, uh, and basically had the back of politicians who wanted to take risks for public safety. So those are the big challenges that we face politically as we face this fight. And I think basically, you know, we were caught when the Newtown uh, shooting happened a couple of years, uh, a couple of years too soon before um, you know, the Americans for Responsible Solutions and the um, Moms Demand Actions and the Mayors Against Legal Guns had to rebuild the infrastructure that you need to take on a uh, kind of monolithic force like the National Rifle Association that is so much a part of the culture of a country like ours. But I think we're getting there. And I think we're getting there because there is now a grassroots, uh, there is now a grassroots on the issue that is being run by very smart people who are doing this in, in cutting edge ways that uh, lots of other organizations aren't doing. So with that, I want to turn it over to, uh, I think we'll start with Peter to talk a little bit about origin story of Americans for Responsible Solution. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Peter Ambler. I am a founder of and strategy director of Americans for Responsible Solutions. Like Mark said, a lot of our um, experiences on this side of the table start with a um, personal tragedy or, or a moment in time. And as Mark alluded to, for me it came um, soon after I had been I, I lost my job after working for a congressman who lost re-election, and I was sort of you know, grappling for new employment. And I was lucky enough to be snapped up by an upcoming rising star congresswoman from Arizona, Indiana Giffords. She hired me in December. We got sort of started planning. You know, she, had, she had just arrived a, um, a really contentious re-election. She was the only Democratic woman in the entire country to win a district that had previously not drunk. She had been granted a rising star, and the sky was the limit. I started officially in her office on January 3rd, 2011, and five days later, she was shot through the head at a supermarket in Tucson, Arizona. I remember a, a couple days after that, actually, um, getting a phone call, and um, and the person on the line, you know, you know talking about gun violence and. Um, all of these things that we have to do, and so on and so forth. And I remember thinking, like, wait, who exactly is Mark Blaze? Um, um, but, um, and you know, at first, in the middle of a, tra of a tragedy like that, um, you, know, you don't sort of put your head above water. You're submerged in it, and you're, you know, everything's so emotional. Um, so, you know, even though we had gone through this tragedy, one of my colleagues was murdered, Two others were shot, one of whom is now Gabby's successor in Congress. Six people died, including a little girl, a federal judge, some other fantastic people. Twelve others were shot. Um, you know, we, 
we didn't sort of th think of this as a gun ground strategy for, for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, a year later, Gabby yeah, resigned, I moved on to another job. You know, Mark went to space and back, her husband, um, Mark Kelly. And, um, and then Newtown happened. And we had sort of put this question off for, for a long, long time. And, you know, you know over these sort of intervening couple of years, had uh, you know, started thinking, you know, I, I took this sort of um, typical American journey from the couch to Wikipedia and learned some things about gun violence in America that stunned me. Um, and after Newtown, and me, Gabby, Mark, and a couple of our other former colleagues got together and, and thought, you know, we can really do something about this. Um, but we sort of looked at the landscape um, and we looked at, you know, the NRA, and we said, you know, we, we, we're gun owners, we're Westerners, but, you know, we don't obviously support what, what they're trying to do vis-a-vis -vis gun safety in the country. We looked um, at the other side with the fine work that Mark and Mayor have been doing, but we thought, you know, we're, we're different from them. We're um, from Texas, Gabby's from Arizona, Mark's a combat veteran, um, and we said, we, we want to occupy a space in the middle where we affirm the right of every American to own a gun in their homes for personal protection, for collection, for sport, whatever it is that they want. We want to do, a, you know, we want to expand back on checks, pass gun trafficking legislation, limit the ability of domestic abusers to, to own guns, but we want to do so in a frame where everything that we do is consistent with our commitment to the Second Amendment, um, and where we're constantly reaching out to gun owners, to veterans, to people who have not typically been on our side of the issue. Um, so, you know, this is a digital organizing panel. And, you know, the, the first thing that we did was we put an email, I mean, we, we put an op-ed in USA Today sort of announcing what, what we were going to do. And we sent an email on like some cheap letterhead Chief Digital Letterhead to Gabby's campaign list of like 20,000 people. Um, and just like we had had initially after Gabby got shot, no idea that we would sort of go down the road of being involved in the fight to reform our nation's gun laws. When we started this thing, we had no idea how um, integral the digital space was going to be to our organizing efforts. But we were lucky enough to team up with some fine folks that a firm called Revolution Messaging, working with people like Scott Goodstein, Tim Tavares, Keegan Gudis, and, 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 and many others. And we soon sort of righted our ship. And, and I mean, this, is, this panel is called um, you know, Using Digital Organizing to Disrupt the NRA. So I sort of identified four ways that we're using the digital space, that we're operating in the digital space to, um, to disrupt the NRA and other elements. Of the, uh, of, of the gun lobby. First, what we're doing is we're turning the very concept of the super PAC on its head. How many people here know what a super PAC is? Good. Um, so when you think of a super PAC, you probably imagine, you know, a, you know, a dark corner um, in a, you know, in a, in a state house, cigar smoke everywhere. Cigars look for But easy on the soul. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, and a, a sort of you know corporate titan writing a big fat anonymous check uh, to some faceless uh, faceless organization. With us, we have Gabby Giffords, Mark Kelly as the faces of our organization, and we are of the eighteen million dollars that we just announced that we we've raised over the, roughly the past year. Over half of that is coming from people um, going online and and chipping in just a little bit of the time. Over half of our $80 million raised has come from contributions of under $200. So, you know, once we start um, spending that money to support candidates who support responsible um, gun legislation to oppose those that do not, you know, we're, we're going to have you know, not only that paid advertising out there, but it's going to represent the investment of the grassroots. In, in a way that super PAC advertising hasn't. So we're really excited. Really excited about the inherent measurability and inter
interactivity of um, the digital space with regard to politics. And obviously, like, the thrust of our electoral efforts are going to be taking place over the next nine months during the midterms. But um, along with some of our allies here at the table, we did wade pretty deep into the off-year Virginia races. And for the first time in 25 years, in the state of Virginia, a state that has historically supported gun rights and is sort of part of the South, we elected the th all three statewide constitutional, um, uh, uh, we elected to all three statewide constitutional offices um, people who support um, gun safety and, and gun responsibility, from Governor Terry McCullough to the Lieutenant Governor to, to the Attorney General. And we, we did that by, you know, one, investing the, the money in, um, that, that we raised online, but more significantly, by being able to target. And historically, you know, electoral media spending is a one-way street. It's 30-second ads, it's mail in, 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 in your mailbox. Everybody here has been inundated with it every two years, every four years, you know how it works. But increasingly, we're able to figure out who the more most receptive people are in the electorate and target them um, based on a, a gun violence message. So in the case of Virginia, for example, we targeted 66,000 independent women in their households. We delivered them both mail and a really aggressive digital program. And we were able to show, because we had a, a digital component to our campaign, that um, our persuasion messages based on gun violence to, to this segment were actually four and a half times more effective than your standard persuasion engagement to that same cohort. And then in the closing days of the campaign, when we targeted a turnout, um, a, a turnout universe, i.e. we're trying to turn people out and we, we delivered a gun violence message to them online, and we got a responsiveness that was 10.2 times the normal engagement, i.e. telling to go vote based on any other issue. We were showing that gun violence is a potent political topic for the electorate, and we we're disrupting this idea that's been perpetrated by the gun lobby and the media for far too long that you can support responsible um, legislation, but you do it um, to your own political peril. We are, that's not right, and we're showing why it's not right using, um, using digital tools. Third, we're able to target key constituencies that have historically, um, have historically sort of been thought of as falling into um, the anti-reform camps. For example, you think about the gun owners and veterans. You know, if you look, if you think about either of those groups as a whole, you know, over the past 20 years, you might say, yeah, they're probably sympathetic to where the pro-gun um, people are. But because we're able to target, because we're able to find the country and find people online, we're able to push back that narrative. For example, we launched Veterans Responsible Solutions, um, which is a you know, growing grassroots movement that has 6,000 people signed up to it. On our list of uh, over 500,000 people, we have 32,000 self-identified gun owners. So we're able to sort of push back in the narrative that you know you can sort of cleave the, the country and the types of people and assign um, for them what their beliefs are. And fourth, we're giving, we're, we're allowing a way to sort of cut through the sort of standard um, forms of media to to allow the country access to the sort of everyday lives of, of Gabby and Mark. We don't have to, you know, we're not depending on um, television interviews, we're not depending on newspaper profiles, we're putting together videos, we're sort of allowing folks around the country who I believe are rightly inspired by the sort of struggles and the determination and the efforts of both Gabby and her husband Mark Kelly um, to sort of get a granular sense of what they're, what they're lives are like, why they're fighting this fight, and um, hopefully that uh, you know, give them a sense that they can fight um, right alongside them. I'll stop there. So, <clears throat> I'm a mother of five. I live in Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, the day after the Sandy Hook shootings, I was online looking for 
something like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, like I've said before. And I spent several hours online looking for this. I couldn't find anything. And I thought, well, what can I do? I'm just a mom. I'm in Indianapolis. And uh, I've got to do something, though, because I feel that the next time there's a shooting like this, if I do nothing, I will be calling on someone. So apparently, hundreds of thousands of other moms had the exact same idea that I did, because uh, you know, within hours and then days and then months, we had thousands and thousands of supporters and offers of help, pro bono help, um, and it quickly started to become a grassroots movement. And uh, you know, it was really just the heavy lifting of mom volunteers funneling all of these uh, offers of support into chapters, much like Mothers Against Drug Driving. Um, and so very quickly, we became a grassroots movement. We, we stood with the president at the White House. We stood with Senator Feinstein when she announced her assault weapons ban bill. And then we started going into our state houses and blocking bad legislation and supporting good legislation. And so here we are 15 months later. We have over 150,000 mom supporters thanks to our merger with Bayers. We have 1.5 million supporters overall. Um, and we really have become the largest grassroots network to go toe to toe with the gun lobby in America. And when you talk about digital organizing, who better to do that than mom? We are a major social media presence. If you look at the data, one out of five American mothers has a Facebook page, and they visit that Facebook page five times a day. And so for us, email, Twitter, Facebook, has become a major way to organize. And, and again, this is about sort of a three-pronged approach. First, at the federal level. So uh, we have had stroller jams. We call them stroller jams. And basically how this started was uh, we were at the State House in Maryland supporting good gun legislation, and our moms were filling the aisles with diaper bags and strollers, and legislators couldn't get by. They had to stop and talk to us. And so we started having these stroller jams all over the country. Um, we've had them in all the state houses. We've had them on public transportation. We've had them at the Capitol level. Um, so we spent a lot of time working on Congress. As you all know, it's a pretty intact intractable Congress, and there's not a lot that's going to get through. Um, but we do have the opportunity at the midterms to go in and fight for making gun violence prevention one of the major voting issues for women and mothers in this country. And it hasn't been until now, and I do believe we can, we can make that happen. At the state level, we'll continue to push for good legislation and go up against bad. Um, but then American businesses, you know, this is something uh, that, that, that other grassroots movements have used very effectively to change the policies as consumers. Um, there's a statistic out there that says 80% of mothers in this country make the spending decisions for their families. That is a huge amount of economic power if we wield it collectively. And so um, what we did, uh, our first digital campaign uh, was going up against Starbucks. And Starbucks had been known for quite a while um, as being at the, the center of, of the gun debate. But we carry activists had felt that Starbucks not specifically saying guns weren't allowed in their stores was sort of tacit uh, an allowance of them having these open carry rallies inside their stores. Um, and so we wanted to push them on that. And, and we knew they were good actors. They had done the right thing in so many different instances. We wanted them to change their gun policy. So last June, when Starbucks announced that they were banning smoking and electronic cigarettes 25 feet outside of their stores, despite state laws, but they were going to continue to follow gun state laws, uh, we decided to, to point out what we thought was hypocrisy. So we embarked on a major social media campaign uh, against Starbucks, asking them to change their policy. Um, first, we had Skip Starbucks Saturdays, where our moms would either make coffee in their own homes or they would go to Starbucks competitors and hold up signs and take pictures of themselves and said, I want my coffee with no cents. And so we made a huge photo album, and, and that became really a sort of a viral campaign. Um, we also had rallies outside Starbucks stores. Um, and then what really helped us as well was to um, make public and, and to put on social media the pictures of people open carrying at Starbucks. It was truly amazing, people going in and buying lattes and taking selfies of themselves with loaded AR-15s. As you can imagine, that, that was somewhat scary to customers. Um, it even got to the point where 60 people showed up at a Sioux Falls Starbucks with everything from handguns to Glocks to AR-15s and AK-47s. Um, and this was happening, and we made that public. <clears throat> and so it really just took three months and uh, Starbucks changed their policy. They came out and said guns were no longer welcome inside their stores. They said they did not want these open carry rallies anymore. It was it made international news, and as you can imagine, um, it was a very campaign we embarked on was actually just a month ago. And so that was uh, to ask.
Facebook and Instagram, Facebook owns Instagram, to do the right thing. And again, these are good corporate actors. They've done the right thing on so many different things, from bullying to sexual violence on their sites, other platforms. And so we wanted them to do the same thing um, with, with guns. And so uh, we, we started um, a variety of social media campaigns, just like we did with uh, Starbucks. Um, we asked moms to tweet and to uh, post on Facebook site um, and to email and call the executives. Uh, we um, had something called the Fast Tweet Facebook Friday. So, you know, some of our moms have used our Fast Tweet tool more than 2,000 times each uh, to tell Starbucks to do the right thing. Um, and we shared stories through social media. We made them interesting graphics and talked about how a 15 year old had illegally purchased a gun across state lines or how a criminal had gotten a gun off of Facebook. Um, and then uh, we'll show you this video now, but if you all recall, recently Facebook gave everyone a look back video. So if you're a Facebook user, you can sort of see with um, very beautiful music all of the memories that you had on Facebook and all the photos you posted. And so we created our own look back video, um, which we think was really the tipping point uh, in this campaign to talk about uh, all of the guns that were being either illegally traded or sold on Facebook.
real implications of gun violence and how you talk about that issue and get reelected because mayors have to. Mayors basically get elected or not based on two things, how the economy is doing in their city and how safe their communities are. Uh, and they also feel this issue personally in a way that members of Congress and state legislators tend not to because it's mayors who get the call at three o'clock in the morning uh, when a police officer is gunned down in the line of duty and it's mayors who get dragged down uh, get dragged down to the hospital uh, when a kid is when a kid is shot, uh, and members of Congress don't get those calls. So there, there's a difference in the way that they that they view those. Mayors have learned, whether Republican or Democrat, how to talk about the issue, how to frame it around crime and not around rights, um, and how to kind of how to how to discuss this as um, you know. Exact framing was uh, we had the otherwise odious Frank once do a poll of NRA members for us, and we have subsequently kind of done focus groups with NRA members. And it turns out that there's basically not a bit of policy disagreement between us as long as we're talking about a certain set of issues. Um, you know, folks on the right believe uh, that everybody should get a background check and that doing much more to keep guns out of the wrong hands, particularly illegal guns, goes hand in hand with protecting the Second Amendment. That's kind of what unified this very otherwise diverse group of almost now a thousand mayors. So we thought that if you could get together and talk to members of Congress um, about that frame, you know, forget about the NRA, think about this as an issue of fighting crime while protecting the Second Amendment, that you could make a big difference over time. So it's been attractive to mayors, uh, and eventually we were able to put together uh, this fantastic group uh, that has I think, made a lot of difference, both through individual lobbying of members of Congress, where where mayors live and through and through group action. Uh, my, my own story, which I basically already told, was sort of uh, brought me into this for interesting reasons that are different from the ones that have, have kind of kept me here. Um, I grew up in, a, in like 8,000 feet elevation and ranching and skiing territory in Colorado where my grandparents and then my parents ran a country store uh, that in addition to groceries and gas uh, also sold um, it made most of its revenue out of hunting licenses and fishing licenses. Uh, and my dad also sold guns out of a glass case and sold enough of them that, uh, in enough volume he actually had to be a federally licensed gun dealer. Uh, so that's the environment that I grew up in, but of working in the store uh, and shooting guns a fair amount with my dad and my uncles uh, on the weekends out in the hills. That's what you do in parts of the country that a lot of folks in Washington don't spend a lot of time in. So for me, you know, having grown up a little bit in that culture, it was an interesting challenge to kind of be on the other side of it, but not really, because um, you know I understood that um, for the most part, um, you know, folks who own guns are not opposed to the things we want to do, uh, but folks who live in these parts of the country have a much greater tendency to be distrustful or mistrustful of government in general. Um, they tend to live in parts of the country where the crime rate is lower. Um, in those parts of the country, uh, the rate of gun ownership is much higher, um, and folks in those parts of the country think they use, and often in fact do use, government services less. So in fact, uh, you know, there's just much more of a disconnect between the good things the government does and much more distrust of government, and it becomes an us versus them question that plays out in a lot of different ways. Healthcare, race, and guns is one of, one of those things. So for me, it started out as an interesting political challenge. I thought I could bring kind of some sense of the mindset of the of the kind of suburban or rural gun owner to it. The reason I stayed um, was just the political challenge and the opportunity to work for somebody like Mike Bloomberg, who brought some of the necessary <laughs> ingredients to changing the issue, which was you know, virtually unlimited resources and a willingness to take risks um, and not care about you know the threats to this person that came fairly regularly. Um, and the political risk that comes from taking on a really powerful interest group, but working with the survivors, um, you know, people like Peter, in fact, um, uh, and others who have been shot themselves, uh, who have lost their children, um, who have lost their uh, other family members, and rather than doing what I would do with my son, who were you know, murdered with a gun, which is go off and never be heard from again, kind of decide that the way that they're going to process this grief is to. Uh, become advocates for the common sense gun laws that everybody basically agrees on, but we haven't been able to, to get done because of the gun lobby. Um, that's why that's why I'm sitting. Um, so, what we have been able to do through you know these thousands of mayors advocates that we put together, we didn't get into this to be a grassroots organization.
organization, but we discovered that there was no grassroots, so with the help of Steve and others, uh, we, we built that network and now we're working with others to, to, to make it even bigger. Um, we have made some progress, um, and then I want to talk about some of the specific campaigns we've run to, to get to those successes. But while we were losing in the Senate, while getting to a majority, we were also simultaneously running campaigns in a lot of states and managed to pass really great um, gun laws, including in some places that were pretty unlikely, and I think we're going to continue to do that in the legislative session uh, that just started in January. We're already having some successes. Uh, last year, for example, um, in Colorado, uh, one of the most gun-friendly states in the nation, we passed one of the two of the toughest gun laws in the station, banning high-capacity magazines that help things that allow mass shooters to fire large numbers of times and kill large numbers of people without reloading and requiring background checks for everybody, no matter where you buy the gun, no matter where you buy it from. Um, we passed a uh, universal background check bill in both chambers in Nevada before the Republican governor of sort of an up and cover, didn't want to take on the NRA, vetoed it, um, and three other states. Uh, and a lot of good bills in other places were going to pass, we're going to pass more. Um, so, kind of move from who we are to actually talking about some of the disruptive campaigns that our organizations are running. All of us have a slightly different kind of patrimony and profile. Um, why don't we start again with Peter to talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff that you do that's specific to kind of the, the position that you guys occupy in the middle of the spectrum. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think um, we're, like, all of our organizations are, are different. Um, different in a couple ways. One, um, you know, we seek to sort of be like a more moderate voice that makes it sort of business every day to, to reach out to unlikely allies. But, it, but also we're, we're, we're very, very small. And, um, you know, we're just you know, maybe seven or eight people who actually work at the organization. And we have um, a following, you know, online of over half a million folks. So, you know, we sort of ask yourself the question, how on earth are seven people going to work with half a million people to advance what our goals are? And the answer, of course, is by um, stitching everybody <coughs> together through um, in the online space, through emails, through websites, through social media. Um, and I mean, I think that the I mean, two things that digital is really allowing us to do that we wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be able to do like I said before, um, is get is target target and measure, and then raise money. So I mean, Mark mentioned the he mentioned to me bill the expanded background checks legislation, which got 55 votes in the Senate, but um, ran into a filibuster. Um, you know that that um, sort of failure, you know, it was unfortunate in that we didn't we just sort of our progress got stalled in Congress. What it did do was it pissed a lot of people off. And we saw an explosion of interest around the country. Um, we saw people seething at, um, on their couches and at their computer terminals. Um, and if we hadn't, up, up you know, until that point, built some sort of digital infrastructure, we as an organization would not have had the opportunity to capitalize and funnel the energy. So not only did we um, sent tens of thousands of phone calls and emails from our supporters to senators and, and other people around the country. But like I said, we raised a ton of money. And specifically, in just the 30 minutes after the, after the, the filibuster occurred and then the bill went down, we raised $100,000 from 2,822 people. Um, and that wouldn't have happened if we had not invested in the digital infrastructure before that point. 48 hours after the after the vote has sort of more people learned about what had happened, learned that the Senate had sort of continued its habit of being in the um, gun lobby's pocket, we raised almost a million dollars from over 22,000 people. You know, people go, and you know, sure we also got envelopes in the mail from, you know, someone's grandma who would pull this because like a nose so, you know, go get them on, on the kitchen stationery. But for the large part, what we raised was was online on uh, people sort of getting angry and then going online and pitching in a couple bucks. Um, we also obviously wanted to further sort of capitalize on that energy. We um, sort of 
sort of started you know investing in, in outreach online. We had you know ads all over the internet, and for a sort of bargain basement prices of about a dollar fifty per acquisition, um, we were able to sign up new supporters. You know, sort of allowing them the opportunity to sign up with their organization, and we in that investment of dollar fifty per person paid back one hundred and ten percent immediately, and um, it paid back three times the um, uh, you know, three times the value of our investment over, over a period of three months. Um, so I, I think that's a that's, that's a good place to stop. But certainly in terms of our ability to target, measure, and raise, um, we could not be where we are today given our sort of you know, rather large following but small stature if it weren't for opportunities presented to us um, in the digital space. We're running it. We've probably got about 10, 10 minutes left. So you know, I think for us, this is an issue of fundraising because we, we break the term of the issue strategy for the first year or so until we merge with readers. So for us, it was about how do we get more and more non members? How do we get them involved? How do we keep them active? You know, it's, it's, it's not enough just to have people like you on Facebook. You want to have these people join your organization, go to state chapter meetings, truly be involved in all of the, the things that we're doing. And so, you know, what we quickly realized is that we needed to organize in a smart way. And so we created a regional manager structure, we created a chapter leader structure, all volunteer for the first year, and, and all of our chapters are still volunteer. And, and to create a social media network where they would get involved in actually emailing. And as I mentioned, we have something called a fast tweet tool. And if you go to uh, monsterinaction.org, you can find your members of Congress, your senators, and your representatives, and then you can actually fast tweet all pre-populated, and, and we've had moms do this thousands and thousands of times. Uh, we had moms who, when their children were taking naps, create videos to show you how to call your member of Congress during the background check. That was pretty revolutionary. It's kind of scary and intimidating to call your member of Congress. You don't think about it, but it's, it's, sometimes that is the case. And so to see a mom telling another mom, here's what you can do while your kids are taking a nap. And so we really just tried to create very sort of mom-friendly social media tactics uh, that, that would work and get people engaged. And very effective with that. If we need people to turn out at a state house, we can get them to do that. If we need them to testify, we can get them to do that. If we need them to bombard people with calls and emails, we can get them to do that. And that has, again, been in part because we're doing things that are mom friendly, some of which are crafts, um, you know, sending in Valentine's or reading things with their kids or seeing their kids' pictures on our national Facebook page where we have nearly 200,000 members. Um, so, so part of that is, is, is really creating things that are mom friendly and running them through that filter. And the other part Moms use social media more than anybody else, and it's a, it's a logical place to get people to act online, but it doesn't matter unless you can then translate that into acting offline. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Gannon, the Digital Strategy Director for Bears Kids Legal Events. And just, I want to leave a few minutes to do questions if we can, but um, one thing I want to say is that I've
concluded more quickly than we, we have seen, but so the question in the face of a pros and Congress is what can you do? Uh, and we have shifted our focus very much to sort of state and local organizing, which I think in this coming election cycle we will see a lot of small wins and a lot of important momentum building. And then corporate campaigns like this Facebook campaign or the Starbucks campaign, which are so powerful, and, but they tell the story of increasing interest and a Congress that is not funneling that interest into action. And so we have to take our energy and put it into other things, local organizing, and these corporate campaigns are the primary example. Uh, do we have a couple minutes for questions? We do. Please light up behind the yeah. So, I have an interesting backstory, I guess. Uh, I share a lot in common with y'all. I was actually grew up in Uray, Colorado. Oh, yeah. So, so that's Yeah, so I worked for Congressman Scott McGinnis as a congressional caseworker, and I'm a father of four. But my father was killed back in August this year in a dinner shooting. He was protecting two small kids that weren't here, so they were running around a restaurant. And the <coughs> family was on the other side of the restaurant, and armed robbers came in, and he tried to protect the kids, and so they shot and killed my dad. But the interesting side of the story is I'm a United States Marine, and I'm an avid gun lover. I own over 250 guns, including a 50 caliber sniper rifle, a bunch of AR-15s, Tech 22s, all kinds of interesting things. I like guns. I believe in responsible gun ownership, and I think that there's. I think I do agree with you on things. I think they should have background checks. I personally, I, even though I'm an NRA member, I don't agree with the fact that anybody should just say, "Hey, let's hand them out like candy." There's no background checks. That's just ass. I do think that even even if I sell my guns, I require some, even though it's not state law, I make them go down and meet me at an FFL dealer and do a background check. Just right. because for me, it's common sense. And that was before my dad was killed. That was before any of that. I own a 50 caliber sniper rifle. There's no reason, there, and for me, there's no purpose for it besides this fun, you know, this cruel to hunt with this, thing like that. But we have, we, that's what we did. That's what we enjoyed. But I think there's things where like, people have got to realize the problem that's going on this year is people that killed my dad. It wasn't guns that killed my dad. It wasn't the, these, the bad people that killed my dad. It was the value they were raised, but you brought up a good point with the saying that in the country these people are isolated because they don't see the violence, they don't see the crime, they don't depend on the government. You think about that. These kids grew up in a city, they, a hardcore city where there were no family values, they were broken, there was all kinds of issues there. I think it's just one part of the whole thing. It's not the whole story itself. It's not how fix things. But there's the big chunk of it because you gotta realize there's values, there's things that you teach your kids, there's things that need to be fixed in our society that are causing huge issues. And I think that's something that I, I, I'm a huge advocate for. And I think that just if we get to the point where we just start saying, hey, we're gonna take our thing away, and that's another issue. But as mayors too, you should see also the fact is the kids that killed my dad, one, the one was on bail for, it was on bail for capital murder. So he had been busted five times while on bail for capital murder. Including two or two or three days before he got killed, my dad. He was busted with a sawed-off shotgun, which even me, as a legal gun owner, that bought all my guns, going through federal background checks, everything else. They put him in jail. He was picked, kept for four hours and released. Five times he was let out. He was let out while he was on bail for capital murder. And a, a gang member, a all a right. past history, at a 19-year-old kid. Right. And so we think that so it's not just the guns. It's also our rules, our regulations, and how we're handling right. things. Thanks. So. No, we, we, we agree. I'm sorry to hear about your Are you still, you're not still here? No, I'm not. I'm That's too bad. That's a great place. Uh, yeah, thanks for, for sharing that uh, story. My name is Stephen Benz. I'm a um, public health researcher at the Health Media Collaboratory, University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, as a researcher, we try to Stay away from bias. I don't do a lot of research in this area, which is good because I'm really passionate. I'm really biased. Um, <laughs> you know, I come from progressive liberals, and I have worked really hard my whole life to appreciate the, the values of, of the Second Amendment and, and governorship and all that. And recently, with all the news, uh, you know, the Florida theater and, and so on and so forth, it's been harder and harder for me to empathize and to relate. And so I appreciate you sharing your story. And, and all of you working working in the middle, I think that's where we need to work. And it's interesting because the comment that, that I most want to share is, is kind of echoing what you're saying, that, that the um, you know background checks and things like that are absolutely necessary, and it's one half of the story. You know, The big thing that I've heard from the NRA in response to Newtown is the same thing that we've heard from news. It's not guns that kill people, it's people that kill people. 
And I haven't ever, ever, ever heard that the NRA do a damn thing to, uh, to try and reduce the number of sick people that we have. My background is in suicide prevention. I worked five years in a suicide prevention call center. I know that people kill themselves with guns, they kill each other with guns. Um, but there's so much that we could do to build a mental health infrastructure. And if the NRA advocated for mental health infrastructure, along with the mayors, along with Congress, along with mothers, you know, like we could build a mental health infrastructure that would be effective and it would promote health in this country. Um, and, and it's just not there. Even though the mental health professionals know what we need to do, we know how to make it good. Like we could do it, but we have all the answers. Uh, but there's there's just no, no movement. So here, here, here are some thoughts that I hope you will take as both validating and, and uh, challenging. Uh, the first is that you know, the vast majority of shootings that take place in this country, you know, 33 gun murders every day, are not perpetrated by seriously mentally ill people of these or Columbine or Tucson Pride. They are perpetrated by street criminals with, with handguns and not by, um, you know, very, very mentally ill young men uh, with assault rifles. So mental illness is clearly a problem in the country. It's clearly not dealt with well enough, but it's not the fault of the problem. Um, and the second fact is, in the United Kingdom, people are not more or less mentally ill than we are. They play the same video games and they watch American movies. But in any given year, there are about 45 or 50 gun murders in the United Kingdom, and there's about 12,000 here, 25 times their rate, I think. And the only difference is the way we regulate guns. So you're absolutely right. The thing that we have to be that we have to be careful about is to both validate the premise, which is totally right, which is that we don't do enough to both identify people who are mentally ill and get them rooted into care, which was, you know, the Tucson problem and the Deagle problem, um, while making it clear to people that um, in a country that doesn't have any money to spend on that and in which the seriously mentally ill is part of the mass killing problem, but not the day-to-day -day problem that is the real gun problem, don't let the NRA distract you with that bright and shiny object. It's really about gun regulation. You won't make a dent the problem until you change government regulation. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that answer that, that helps clarify things. And I, I would just say that there's a difference between mental illness and mental health. And sure. I think that all of those individual shootings are, I mean, a person's not gonna kill somebody else if they're all around healthy, economically. Right. Yeah. Yes. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Also to say, you know, there's, you, know, you brought up the slogan, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And that's, that, that's right. But the thing is, we know who the people are who use guns to kill other people. And they're prohibited from owning guns, and that's why we need background checks. I like an interesting part of my dad's back. So a few weeks before, sorry, I'm going to jump in, but a few weeks before my dad died, so uh, there's another robbery of down the street. And the lady had a lady with a three armed robbers came lady who was in the back of the five shots of all And what she did is she, you know, she came out of the back of all the crowd these guys and chased them off. And they think it's the same three guys. And one lady with a five shot revolver from the CHL, she was able to stop those. Nobody was injured, nobody was hurt. Two weeks later, my, my best friend that was with my dad in the primary shot has a CHL. He left it home because the gun walls are so hard, it's just not worth it to carry a CHL. And he said, there and watched my dad get shot and killed. And as I so I, 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 I'm not against God. I agree that there's not much better to agree and there's some ridiculous in mental health and everything else, but there is things where you get too close to something we have in this country is the beauty of our freedoms. If you want to sacrifice our freedoms, to where then that if you have we kind of find a balance between that, that's why I guess we have more most, we have more sacrifices. The reason why is that we have more sacrifices is still because that's because of what we have. We want to move to what Peter has, we want to be we want to be on a back track. Uh, yeah, so this is a more general question about um, grassroots volunteer driven campaigns. Um, just very simply, a uh, challenge with that is keeping people, keeping your volunteers, and you mentioned you have a volunteer even structure, uh, leadership structure, um, keeping them on message and on the same page. I would just, I'd love to hear any strategies. Yeah. I, had a, I had a 15 year career in public communications, and that helped with that. I stayed home on the phone
biggest challenges, but I think it's the reason that we've been so successful is because we have won that battle of staying on top of our communications and, and keeping our brand forward. So there's some level of, of policing it, and then also, as you said, when you're recruiting them, that's just sort of it's part of the, if you're going to do this, understand this aspect of the message. Before we even knew what we were doing, frankly, we had a training in place to say, when you post on Facebook, when you talk to the media, when you communicate about this issue, this is where we stand as an organization. If you're part of our organization, this is what we're saying. We're not anti-gun. We're not about banning guns. We are about common sense reforms. And so that has been a very important part of our program. Thanks. I'm actually told we're, we're out of time. I think somebody probably needs the room. Uh, after us, so um, if, uh, I think we will probably, having absolutely nothing to do other than this, we'll probably congregate in the room right outside, so if you want to ask questions, please feel free to meet us out there. Thank you, everyone, for coming.